I declare the meeting open to the public. Can I remind members about the protocols regarding the, uses of, the use of electronic devices? May I also advise those in the public gallery that mobile devices may be used through a Wi-Fi connection and all devices should be muted. Password details are set out in the gallery rules for anyone wanting to connect to the Assembly's Wi-Fi network. 3G and 4G should not be used and no recordings or photographs are to be taken. Um, so, uh, apologies then. Do we have any apologies received in the committee office? Any members aware of apologies? Okay, moving on to chairperson's business there. Um, myself and Pam met earlier or later uh, last week with um, the Donate for Dahi campaign, the family of Dahi McGowan, who is, who is awaiting heart surgery, and they were looking to outline to us the issues around the soft, out, soft opt out organ donation legislation, which they would be very supportive of. Uh, donation levels here are poor compared to many other regions. I think that's, that's an area of huge concern and um, I would hope that, that they will be coming back to us via the, the, the full committee to outline some of the issues and that we can maybe do a session on that issue. Um, Pam, do you want to say anything in relation to that? No, just, well, I suppose yes. Um, just to say that it was, uh, it was, it was lovely to meet, to meet the family and uh, himself and uh, it's just heartbreaking really to see, you know, what they're going through, and really, I think if we can find solutions to this, um, it, it has to be done. That's just. I also met with the Alzheimer's Society and Diabetes UK. Um, in relation to in relation to Alzheimer's Society, they're flagging up huge concern around diagnosis levels and early diagnosis of Alzheimer's and the impact that that has on getting appropriate supports in place. We also discussed quite heavily with both organisations the issue of emotional support. These are hugely life-limiting conditions and I think the emotional support is sometimes overlooked. The health service sometimes has a tendency to look at the principal diagnosis and, and deal with that. Um, in terms of diabetes, as well as the emotional support, one of the issues that was being flagged up was the use of pumps, insulin pumps, which are, again, much more widely used across other jurisdictions, and waiting lists would be much less for those pumps. So I think that's an area of concern as well. The, the last uh, fi final meeting to mention just is myself, again, and Pam, and other parties from across all parties. I think we're invited, met with Charlotte Caldwell, the uh, father of Billy Caldwell, who has had a very public campaign around the issue of medicinal cannabinoids. Um, and again, they were identifying that there's gaps between how that is managed here versus England, certainly, and potentially the South. But um, we had said to them, I suppose, well, clarify the gaps and, and come back. And if you wish to come back to the committee at a future point in time, that would be, that would be a valid thing to do. Um, but I suppose we were, we were seeking more information from them in terms of where the gaps were. Ian Pam, do you want to mention anything in relation to that? Uh, no, uh, well, yes. I keep saying no. Uh, <laughs> uh, yes, just to say that, <clears throat> yes, there were gaps that have just appeared that the main factor is whilst kind of politicians have moved on it, um, clinicians haven't. There's a, there's a huge gap in research because of, um, because of where cannabis sat for want of a better word so that that is a huge problem and something that you overcome so i'm sure we will hear about it in the future from the committee okay so that concludes that uh, the draft minutes i refer members to the amended draft minutes on the meeting held on 23rd of january which are pages 74 to 85 of the meeting pack are members content with the minutes May I also refer members to the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 30th of January, which are pages 89, 86 to 96 of the pact. Are members content with those minutes? Yes, uh, Chair, I did speak to the clerk just about Dunmurray. Um, there was quite an extensive discussion at different points through the meeting, so just to have it recorded on record somewhere that we did take note of the uh, report. I think it had come out actually on that day, uh, so it was quite timely. So uh, just to I suppose reinforce that and the request to have the uh, commissioner present to speak to that report. But I think, yeah, more than happy. Remember asking for the minutes to be changed? Well, even just even now reiterating it, I'm happy with this to go forward, but it didn't reflect it. But I just think going forward, because to be fair, I think we speak to the correspondence 
but it didn't necessarily come under correspondence because there were no correspondence. Maybe it should have been AOB on that date. But I, you know, I'm content to let the minutes go through, but just that it doesn't become lost going forward in the forward work planning. Yeah. You know. Okay. Um, and would, would, could we agree now that we invite the uh, Commissioner and, and record yeah, that yeah. for this? Yeah. Does this mean that we, we officially yeah. invite the Commissioner? Yeah. Thank you. Members agree? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. So are members content then on that basis with those minutes? Yes. Yeah. Uh, matters arising, I can advise members that there are no matters arising. So we're moving on then to the departmental briefing. And I'd like to advise members that departmental officials are here today to brief the committee on waiting, elective waiting times. I refer members to paper at pages 99 to 107 of the pack. Members will be aware that the briefing paper deals with elective cure waiting times, and that is primarily what officials have been invited to discuss today. I'm sure that the serious situation facing the emergency departments will be on members' minds, and I'm sure officials will be able to provide some basic information. But can I suggest that we schedule a dedicated session on that matter in coming weeks and largely focus on elective waiting times today as planned? Okay, so I'd just like to welcome Ms Sharon Gallagher, Deputy Secretary for Transformation, Planning and Performance. So, so just like to mention, uh, welcome Ms Sharon Gallagher, Deputy Secretary for Transformation, Planning and Performance, and Ms Lisa McWilliams. Interim Director for Performance, Management and Service Improvement in the Health and Social Care Board. So I'd just like to invite the officials to brief the committee, please. Thank you, Chair. Bear with me, it's an age thing. <laughs> <laughs> so good morning, Chair, and thank you for the opportunity to brief the Health Committee on waiting times for elective care. A short paper has been provided in advance, which I hope has been found helpful. With your permission, I will outline again some of the points covered in that paper in my opening remarks, as I think they are important. It is regrettable that any patient has to wait longer than they should for a diagnosis, an assessment or treatment, and I fully understand the distress and anxiety that long waits cause, particularly when patients are suffering pain and discomfort. Waiting lists are seen as a measure of the state of the health service and are judged as an indicator of its performance. When they lengthen, this affects the public's confidence in the health service, who are understandably concerned about being able to get the help they need when they need it. The way services are structured is no longer fit for purpose, particularly as demand continues to increase year on year. Whilst in the few years up until 2015, additional non-recurrent funding allowed the position to be managed, a reduction in the amount of additional investment coupled with workforce challenges, has seen the capacity gap grow since then. In other words, patients are waiting longer than they should. Where patients' needs are deemed as urgent or of the highest clinical priority, they will always be seen more quickly, but inevitably others will experience long waits. Over the last nine years, demand has risen by 9.3% for consultant-led outpatient services and by 2.4% for treatment. Regionally, in 2019, it is estimated that there is a gap between funded health service capacity and patient demand of approximately 35,000 new outpatient assessments and 41,000 inpatient day case treatments. In a few weeks' time, I will be back in front of you to outline progress with the transformation agenda. This briefing is not unrelated, as waiting lists are in many ways a symptom of the need for change. In December 2016, the Department launched its 10-year strategy for transforming health and social care, delivering together. Underpinning that strategy, a plan to redress the problems in elective care was published. Both documents recognised that long-term sustainability could not be achieved without dealing with the backlog. As a result, £30 million of transformation funding was allocated non-recurrently for waiting list activity in 2018-19, with a further £17.6 million this year. The funding has allowed 120,000 additional interventions in 2018-19 and will enable an anticipated 70,500 this year. But it is important to say that this has served only to stem growth in waiting times. It is anticipated that a further £30 million will be invested in 2021 to help manage urgent and red flag referrals only. 
Whilst non-recurrent funding is of course welcome and can benefit large numbers of patients, as outlined earlier, it is a short-term solution. It is imperative that new ways of working are introduced which will radically change the way services are accessed and delivered in the longer term. There is no point continually doing more of the same. The elective care plan is still the roadmap for change. In terms of implementing this plan, pace has been slower than we would have hoped, given the scarcity of resource, but important progress has been made against all of the stated commitments. I have already mentioned the impact of non-recurrent funding on waiting times, and I will outline some other key, key developments. A pain-specific section has gone live on the My ANI website to help people self-manage painful and disabling illnesses. Capacity and capability in primary care has been expanded to allow more people to be seen or treated in the GP setting rather than referral to hospitals. Multidisciplinary teams are now in place in five GP federation areas across the province, one in each trust area. And it is anticipated that by the end of this financial year, 462,000 patients will have access to a primary care multidisciplinary team in their local GP practice. Not only does this ease pressure for GPs and allow patients to access more services closer to home, but in time this will reduce referrals to secondary care. GPs can now seek advice from colleagues in secondary care electronically to manage patients locally. And additionally, we have taken forward work which will modernise and reform secondary care. The introduction of the virtual fracture, fracture clinic, for example, has helped reduce demand in fracture clinics by about 25%. Prototypes for day case surgery hubs for varicose veins and car car sorry, cataract procedures have been operational since December 2018 and are currently being evaluated. The evaluation will inform any future delivery models which will be subject to consultation. And importantly, a number of reviews in areas such as stroke, breast assessment and urgent and emergency care are ongoing to ensure services are configured best to meet future demand. But provisional information so shows that at the end of December 2019, over 110,000 people have been waiting longer than a year for the first outpatient assessment, and more than 27,000 are waiting over a year for surgery. This is wholly unacceptable, and the Executive has acknowledged this. As outlined earlier, it is anticipated some £30 million investment could be utilised locally to meet demand for urgent and red flag cases in 2021. Additionally, the New Decade New Approach Agreement sets out an ambitious target which states that no one waiting over a year at 30 September 2019 for outpatient or inpatient assessment or treatment will still be on a waiting list by March 2021. The cost of delivering the additional activity necessary to ensure this commitment is met is approximately £50 million. The level of funding available will be made clear with the Budget Bill, but I can assure the Committee work is already underway to ensure any additional investment is fully utilised to best effect. In terms of red flag and urgent cases, planning activity has commenced with trusts. It is expected that this work will fully utilise any in-house or local IS capacity. In relation to the New Decade New Approach commitment, additional capacity will be required from NHS and independent sector providers outside of Northern Ireland. Whilst firm steps cannot be taken to secure any additional capacity until the funding position is settled, the Health and Social Care Board are already scoping viable options. Every effort will be made to secure the additional capacity required elsewhere. However, it should be borne in mind that Northern Ireland is not unique in their waiting list position. Where capacity exists, it will be heavily sought after by multiple players. It is also important to bear in mind that there will be a cohort of patients who, due to comorbidities or other factors, will not be suitable for transfer to other providers, particularly where travel is involved. Careful consideration will be afforded to how these patients are managed, but it may not be possible to meet their needs within available capacity locally. In summary, addressing the waiting list backlog and reforming services to ensure future sustainability is complex and it will take time. There is a long-term plan, 
but multi-year recurrent funding is required over and above what is needed to deliver core services. The required investment is estimated in the region of £750 million to £1 billion over a five- to ten-year period, depending on the capacity available. In the short term, I can assure the Committee that all steps are being taken to ensure any additional funds allocated for 2021 are maximised to deliver the best outcomes for patients. I'm happy to take any questions. Okay, thank you, Sharon. Um, in relation to the argument, the paper, the paper quotes a requirement for 750 million to a billion additional resource. Can you break down for us in terms of how you've arrived at that figure and how it will be spent and what outcomes it could deliver? So I'll ask Lisa to cover the breakdown of how we've arrived at the figure in terms of how it will be spent, um, Chair. Um, I mean, the, uh, it's based on two elements. First of all, dealing with the backlog nearly as a ring-fenced entity and then delivering transformation. So the two aspects that I set out in my opening remarks. Um, we cannot contaminate future models with the backlog. Um, and I use that word uh, carefully because we, if we continue just to do what we're doing with the backlog, we won't trans transform in any way the way services are delivered and accessed. We already know that our structures are um, out of date um, and we need to completely transform both our primary care and secondary care uh, services, but also we need to enable people to look after their health better um, through the making life better overarching strategy. So it will be multiple measures um, and it will be co-produced in terms of how we bring forward change. Delivering Together sets out the broad uh, premise of how that will be taken forward, but each of those steps and measures will be co-produced to make sure that we develop the right response um, for the people locally. Okay. And can you provide the committee with further detail in writing on the breakdown of those figures? In, in I the can, of weeks? course. Thank you. Five years ago, the committee had flagged up the fact that there was a gap in terms of the data um, and that uh, a move to um, referral to treatment actually would be a much more um, realistic measure. So will the new Encompass system or integrated digital record enable tracking of the, uh, of the referral to treatment? Is it a specific aspect of the design brief for Encompass or can it be added as a requirement? It will be able to measure that. Yes, I can confirm that. Okay, and finally from me for now before we go to members, um, you mentioned there very specifically that dealing with the figures would, would uh, require use of other NHS facilities and the independent sector. Have the 26 counties, and, and especially where there are comorbidities and where travel is an issue, are, we, are you exploring capacity in the 26 counties? We are indeed. Actually, Lisa and myself were in Dublin earlier this week uh, to discuss options with, with colleagues in Dublin. And have you anything in terms of progress? Is there potential progress there that you can tell us about? Um, I think it's exploratory at this stage, as you will understand, Chair, they're in a challenging position also uh, in terms of their capacity and demand issues. But the conversation continues and, and we have made a commitment um, to keep engaged with colleagues in Republic of Ireland. Okay. Thank you. Well, uh, I have now indicated Pam, Alex, Jerry, and Paula in that order. Pam. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your presentation for being here today. It's obviously a huge, a huge issue, and there's no point um, kind of um, over-egging it here. Um, I just wanted to ask a question uh, based on time on the previous on the previous committees for health, uh, and that was around um, the coding. Um, so at one stage, the, one of the previous committees looked at the issue of um, waiting, but also at missed appointments, and where that was coming, and in particular, um, where hospitals were cancelling appointments. And um, from my very poor memory, I remember there was there were issues around um, how um, clinicians leave was recorded, that type of thing. So somebody would get an appointment. But actually, they hadn't factored in the fact that clinicians were, were not going to be there. So that either moved to another clinician or, or was cancelled and put off to another time, postponed. Um, but, but recording was not uniform around Northern Ireland. I'm just wondering, has that issue been addressed? Uh, and do we have a more unified um, process of recording those details? 
I'm happy to take that question. Um, so you're, you're referring to the um, do not attend and the cancellation rates in hospitals. Yes. Um, so cancellation rates in hospitals, you're right, at a point in time, um, we would have had a level of, I suppose, unplanned, uh, well, planned leave, but at short notice. Uh, and with our clinic templates, patients would have already been booked six weeks in advance, and then we would have had clinicians booking leave. Uh, that practice has largely been eradicated. Uh, where we do have cancellations, and there are still cancellations, it's largely due to sudden uh, sickness or bereavement or childcare breakdown in clinical teams that can't be avoided, um, or cancelled procedures due to um, theatres running over um, in, in more complex emergency uh, procedures. Um, and then some of the cancellations are booked in error, um, but that's a very small level. But that practice of short notice, planned leave, has, has been very heavily scrutinised by the Trust Medical Directors um, and has largely been eradicated. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, and just one other um, thing uh, to raise with you. I'll just come off my head. Um, I want to come back to you? Yes, please. Yep. Alex. Thank you. Um, thank you for your presentation. Um, going back to the clinics being cancelled. <laughs> um, it's not about, well, extra sources is part of the reason uh, that you need to try and move clinics forward and reduce the waiting list, but that's not the only reason. Uh, you know, so we have the, can uh, the cancelled clinics as an issue, um, missed appointments. Um, lack of nurses. I mean, there's over 2,000 odd. You know, um, and obviously then having to use the independent sector providers, that's costing you actually more money because they're dear. Um, do you not think part of the problem has been caused, but not totally, I'm not, not blaming everybody in the health service for this, but it's the fact there's so many council clinics because even with the reasons that you said you've, they've been reduced, there's still, I think it was 200,000 clinics or something cancelled. We got told last week or something like that. And then we've got hundreds of thousands of appointments being cancelled. You know, this is, a, this is actually building and building and building a large part of it because of those reasons. And it's not because of the resources so much, although that is part of it. You know, and, and the reason I partly know that because I used to work for the health service, so was very much involved in the appointments. Um, so, you know, and you, you mentioned about the 35,000 extra outpatient appointments you need, but surely if we could cut those clinics down and get more people attending, you wouldn't actually need the 35,000. So what are you actually doing to reduce the way people are we're dealing with it, if you know what I mean, yeah, and yeah. not turning up and stuff like that. Yeah, I think the first thing that I would say is um, the percentage of um, DNAs and, and cannot attends has reduced from 8.3% in 2015-16 to 7.8% in 2018-19. In Partial booking in the main is attributed to that, where people can um, book up to six weeks in advance. Um, in addition, in some trust, text messaging has been introduced to remind people um, about their uh, appointment, um, and some media campaigns highlighting, you know, the impact of cancelled appointments or, or um, not attending on others. Um, the other thing that I would say is missed appointments don't uh, equate to downtime necessarily. Um, double booking uh, takes place to ensure that there is a, you know, that that um, where misappointments um, happen, that others can uh, step in. Um, but in any case, those clinicians um, are redeployed in other areas and, and can do other work um, where there is an, a, a missed appointment. So it's not as if the uh, people not attending equates to downtime necessarily. Well, it does because they move on to get another appointment at a later date. So it adds the to your list, really. Yeah, indeed, although the, uh, the double booking means that someone else gets seen in their place yeah. who is taken from the list, so there's a net uh, position. Yeah. But it still adds up down yeah. the road, <laughs> to be honest. Okay. Go ahead. I was just going to say, um, most clinics, um, 
already build in a level of DNA based on what their experience is in the last year and in the last two years. So, and Sharon's referring to that. That's we, so we overbooked uh, clinic slots so that we actually take account of the D, of the do not attends, okay. um, and our do not attend rates are comparable with England, Scotland, and Wales. Yeah. Thank you. What? No. Yeah. A second question. Yes, go ahead. Uh, I have to change that because I have to have a second question. So. <laughs> um, you need a billion pounds or 750 for the transformation, but that's transformation of the, the health service sort of in general. But how much money, or do you have a figure, how much money do you actually need to bring the waiting lists down to, like, I'll say a zero level, if you know what I mean? Um, so we, we have an elective care, uh, care plan that was published um, in, in 2017 and we repeatedly run the demand and capacity and the costing exercise for that. Um, so it was last updated um, at the end of last year and the backlog, so the patients who are already breaching uh, waiting times um, has, was costed at that point in time £435 million. Pounds. And the capacity gap just to address the gap in outpatients and treatments that we've referenced, which does, we have in, incorporated a level of efficiency and productivity to take account of new ways of working in those numbers. That's sitting at 96 million, but we acknowledge that's an underestimate because we are, if we're not assessing patients, we're not transferring them or converting them for treatment. So, you know, it, it, it's a minimum of 535 just at a point in time to hold steady, but we have added patients to the waiting list since that calculation was done. Thank you. Uh, yes, thank you. And it was actually, it was, um, I want to come back to the first question, but they, um, because I don't think you quite answered it, the question on the coding. So is there consistency now in, you know, across Northern Ireland in, in coding? And I suppose in, in, um, in whatever, Form filling or, or um, electronic care records that are, are happening is, is a consistent coding ac across so that we have comparable data. Yeah, um, so we have we have a number of, uh, of policies that actually have been developed in the last number of years and updated to actually ensure that there was no ambiguity in some of our coding definitions and how they've been applied, um, and that's a rolling program. Um, but it, there has been significant realignment of, uh, and not you know there are areas outside of elective that also have the same where we've done focused work on coding. So there is an entire coding team um, in the health and social care board supporting the trusts and training the coders in the trusts to make sure that everybody has a standardised practice. Is that um, ongoing training, or, oh, or? It, we continue? We we continue to ensure that we have sufficient coding workforce within the trusts. Um, to ensure that information is coded in a timely manner. Okay, and the wee bit I couldn't think of was it was actually around communication that links into some of Alex's um, questioning as well. Um, and you talked about trust that some of them have introduced text messaging, but you know some of them, but not all of them. Um, and I know I know from my own personal experience, letters and text messages or communications that come from the health service um, that some services are, will offer you to go online and actually book your own appointment which is obviously going to save well it's going to save a body to the other end and it's, it's going to mean you're going to picking something that suits you um, so that's positive but it, again uniformity across the board never seems to be there and that's quite frustrating and i've certainly encountered um times when because i've moved house that um communications for appointments that you're desperately waiting for are still going to previous addresses and this has happened on several occasions in my household alone and that's despite the fact that at every opportunity we would always update and, and, and check and say look do you have the right address do you have the right address and yet it still seems to go astray so are there any plans to in, you know to make sure that um that those records are tight and really kept well, so that, that we're not being missed. Um, electronic care records, so NIECR and Encompass are both in that space in terms of making sure that our systems are more connected um, and actually are more, in some cases, more automated to actually make sure that when you update an address in one specialty, it actually is updating your record everywhere. Um, so Encompass and the electronic care record are absolute tools for that. Okay. Uh, can I just finally, on that electronic le record, ask... So quickly. we had the electronic care record and now we're moving into Encompass or is Encompass already alive and running? No, no, uh, Encompass goes live um, 
next September in the first trust and then rolls out to each subsequent trust on a six monthly basis. So and next we see the old electronic care. Will it it more feeds and encompass. Yeah. You. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, now, Jerry, then Paula, Sinead, then Gemma. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks for the presentation. Um, just a couple of quick points and a couple of quick questions. Um, one of the figures that stuck out for me the most um, in the last few months was the figure around Merseyside and World Trust. I think I was uh, waiting lists combined uh, that said that uh, uh, their, their trust is about uh, slightly bigger than all our trusts combined, and there was 10 people uh, as a whole uh, on a waiting list for a year. Whereas here, I think it's 120,000, I think you said 115,000. Um, and it's quite uh, remarkable that a trust uh, almost the same size as ours combined. There's so little people seemingly on waiting lists, whereas here, there's I think there's 3,000 times uh, more likely to be on a waiting list um, for people here. So that was quite worrying, obviously, on top of the figures that you've uh, referenced. Um, I, I think Alex's points about understaffing of nursing is key. Um, he, he said 2,000 uh, people. My understanding was about it's 3,000. Um, uh, nurses were short in the health service, so a comment uh, on that, please. Um, and I think something that I would um, hope would be possible. Um, I mean, is there in terms of um, um, I would just call it emergency sort of planning or sort of task force in the deal with this uh, crisis? Um, is there any sort of uh, conversations on the ground level going on with sort of um, trade unions and workplace representatives to say? I would imagine if you went into hospitals to say, can you help us you know, to deal with these wait lists in a, in a rapid way? I would imagine the most um, you know people who can would be willing to offer a bit more if they could in terms of overtime or or, or those kind of um, um, uh, issues. So uh, just to kind of let, I'd like to ask the detail uh, of that in terms of the likes of hospitals, the likes of um, um, places like that. What's what's happening on the ground in terms of trying to tackle uh, this? Um, I think obviously recruitment is key, but also retention uh, is key, and hopefully the, the pay parity uh, issue, um, hopefully being resolved, and uh, will encourage more uh, nurses and healthcare workers to to stay here rather than go uh, elsewhere. Um, and I think also I think um, the, the structural problems are key, and I think the sort of significant withdrawal of funding in the last ten years, which is, has affected the health service, has to be talked about. I don't think that's talked about enough in terms of waiting lists. There's been a serious withdrawal of funds from the health service in the last uh, 10, 11 years, and that has to be addressed if we were going to tackle uh, this, this issue. And it seems to be we're always sort of running to stay afloat, and there's a crisis you know, around the corner every time. Uh, and just finally, I think um, I think spending in-house is key. Uh, people that I speak to are concerned that there's a, um, a strategy, a sort of a slow bit privatisation of the health service to say we'll have to ship it out to the independent sector, ship it out to the, the independent sector. And it's my understanding, and I would I like clarity on this, that pretty much every single treatment can be done in-house. I think there's maybe one or two issues that um, currently there's no capacity within the NHS, but pretty much um, maybe whatever five percent of, of uh, treatments um, uh, can be can be done uh, in house within the within the NHS. So, just a comment uh, on those uh, points, please. Thanks, Chair. Thank okay, um, I'll cover them in the way that I've written them down. And <laughs> yeah, no problem, remind yeah. me of I know there's a lot the there. Thanks. <laughs> no. Um, first of all, in terms of the vacancy level for nurses, um, my understanding is that it is in and around the 2000 mark, but I will um, confirm that in writing um, to the committee. Um, in terms of uh, staffing um, and trade unions, um, the change agenda um, is very clearly based on co-production. We've said that up front in our Delivering Together a strategy document. All of the areas that we're taking forward um, it comprise of task and finish groups or collaborations that include staff, include clinicians, include those that work in services, because we have recognised that actually the right decisions in terms of delivery models and policy decisions cannot be made in offices in the Department of Health, and we need to talk to those people that are deliver our services. So that is a firm commitment of any change, including waiting lists, uh, that we take forward. In term. In terms of um, retention, the workforce strategy was one of the key documents uh, developed and published, co-produced with trade unions um, as a result of our Delivering Together strategy. Um, and uh, in that, there will be a number of work programmes that look at how we recruit, but more importantly, how we retain staff and empower staff to get the best out of them to do the job that they want to do. Um, in terms of funding, um, 
I guess I would say no matter how much money you put into health, it just eats it up. It's on record to say that you know we could consume all of the block grant within the next number of years. That is why transformation is so important. We need to change the way we do things, and transformation will take additional money on top of what is needed to deliver core services. So I acknowledge your point about it nearly a bottomless pit for money, and that will remain so unless we completely uh, and radically change the way we, we deliver services. Um, in terms of uh, spending in-house, I mean, our primary uh, focus is to use in-house capacity. It is only when in-house capacity is completely exhausted for any discipline that we move outside of that, but there are circumstances when that's needed. Um, and in particularly, if we uh, secure additional funding through the budget for waiting list initiatives, we will need to look elsewhere uh, outside of in-house capacity or NHS capacity in order to help us reduce the waiting lists for a period of time. Um, and I, I think that covered all of your points, but... Can I just perhaps? quickly, Chair, uh, Very quickly, Chair, you've had a Your right. last point about looking at, uh, for out-of-house out um, sort of services to tackle waiting lists, can you detail uh, about that? Because there is a concern about you know, doing that you know, when there's facilities, when there's um, um, staff you know, available in the NHS with the expertise to, to do that. So I would just like to further sort of ask about that. So in relation to, for example, the new decade, new approach a target, our, our first port of call will be NHS in-house mm. outside of Northern Ireland after we have exhausted everything locally. It is only after we have exhausted that route that we will move to independent sector providers. So uh, once again, I would stress that our primary route is through in-house employees, and only after that is exhausted do we move elsewhere. Sure. Thanks. Paula. Thank you. Thank you, ladies. I um, just want to continue that a little bit. Um, if I picked you up correctly there, you said that you'll get the money, the additional money, hopefully. Um, you'll exhaust in-house. You'll then go to the independent sector outside Northern Ireland, and then the independent sector in... And why, why would you do it in that order? So I guess there's, there's two blocks of money, if you like, for waiting lists. The waiting lists, there's continuing what we've done over the last number of years, which is dealing with the red flag in urgent cases. So that deals with suspected cancer. They're very, you know, time is of the essence Absolutely. with those cases, which is why we would look at our in-house capacity locally for that and then our IS capacity locally for that. So that's for that 30 million pounds, hopefully ring fenced mm -hmm. to address those type of cases. The new decade new, new approach is for the longest waiters. Mm -hmm. so, they, um, so for that, we recognise that we will have exhausted all of our capacity in-house and at IS level for a red flag and urgent. And for the longest waiters, then we will move outside of the province for that. So it's really maximising everything that we have locally for a red flag and our urgent. And even if we, we do that, uh, we may not uh, meet all of the demand in that area. Okay, just, um, I just want to continue and then I have another question. Uh, have you, what discussions have you had with the independent sector that they would be exhausted after that first 30 million? So I'll uh, let Lisa address that point, but it's really based on our, uh, on our arrangements over previous years and our understanding of what's there at the minute. But you haven't had a, 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 a contemporary conversation with them? I'll let Lisa talk a little bit to the, the detail on that. Yeah. Uh, and I suppose if we take it back, so in the last two years, as Sharon has indicated, we have targeted money at the red flag and urgent, so those most clinically urgent. Um, and in the first year, we were able to fully maximise spend of just under 28 million, uh, which was in-house and IS. Um, and this year, um, with our 17 million, um, only 1.3, sorry, 5.4 of that is currently IS spend. Um, IS capacity, if you take it back, and Sharon had alluded to 2014-15, we were maybe spending 50 million in the IS. Um, that took time for the IS companies to actually build up that capacity. Um, and it would be fair to say, with the amount of money that, that we have been spending in the IS, that capacity will take time to regrow. Um, but it's always that balance, and back to yeah. Jerry's point about maximising in-house yeah. um, and then the IS. So 
we are in the process of a, of a new procurement system uh, that the IS companies are all aware of, um, which replaces a previous procurement which will pick up Northern Ireland IS, but also allows, and back to the 26 county, uh, ROI currently use the existing system. So that so all the providers know that we are working through that new contractual arrangement to allow the market to then be tested and then the IS contracts come through that. Um, but we, at this point in time, we haven't had any direct conversations to ask any provider for their capacity because we need to work through the steps of making sure that we maximise the in-house okay. and don't risk losing um, across to the IS in that process. That's fair enough. Um, just a, a separate question then, and it's, I think it was in a paper we received separately and it was saying there was 140,000 patients waiting for a diagnostic um, test for the service. Yeah. I'm just wondering how much... These are looking at um, procuring new diagnostic, um, you know, for a capital expenditure. Because I would say, if you had more up-to-date equipment, you might be able to get things through quicker and more um, effective, basically. Absolutely. So within the uh, costing of the 30 million for the red flag and urgent, five million of that is for diagnostics. Okay. Um, and about three million of that is additional mobile CT and MRI, which is a quick way of getting additional capacity that doesn't take you know, six months of commissioning a new build and all the work around that. So we're absolutely looking at how do we maximise because, um, you know, diagnostics play a key role in actually getting patients through their pathways and we do need to increase our capacity. OK, thank you very much, Chair. Thank you. Um, Sinead, then Gemma, then Orlea. Okay. Thank you for your presentation. Um, it, it, I suppose it's the overarching thing of standardisation. While I appreciate um, the reach out to the independent sector, um, would be required and helpful in certain circumstances, but also to have a full understanding of at what point are those patients pulled back in in terms of aftercare and whatever else is available to them because the expense could very quickly run away. And then that obviously uh, detracts from being able to offer your own resource. And the other, it, it's just really. Um, to clarify, Chair, on the question that you asked about the Encompass, um, we have been advised that at one point the department's line was that the vast majority of the patient journey would be captured with Encompass and that the um, review meetings may not be there. And I take your firm assurance that it is. But just to, to be clear, is that something that was recognised and corrected? within the Encompass system, or was the messaging that came out at one time to say that it was the vast <coughs> majority and it would be reliant on other systems, was that incorrect at that time? Because there does appear to be a change in that response. So if I pick up on the question, yeah. Encompass, and then Lisa could maybe cover the, um, uh, the aftercare uh, piece. I think Encompass has developed over time. It's a new system responsive to a new way of working. Um, what I'm advised is that under any referral to treatment a target, that that full patient journey will be able to be measured, so we will be able to measure that target in, in the way that you've described. Okay, in a way that's comparable with other areas, because we're not able to compare. Yes, yes. we can't do that at the minute, okay. and we will be able to do it with Encompass. Okay, and, and the fact that we're only measuring as well new <coughs> additions to pressures, we're measuring the tip of the iceberg in terms of not always adding on the backlog of waiting times to the other. Um, uh, if I might, I, I think, Sinead, you're, you're referring to either plans yes, and yeah. reviews. Yeah. Um, so. Planned and reviews, we, we currently are able to see um, review appointments and patients who are beyond their clinically indicated data review, and we can al we also track planned across a number of specialties, um, largely general uh, general surgery and scopes would be for planned. Yeah. So we can already see that um, the referral for treatment, as, as the definition in England, Scotland and Wales, doesn't take account of reviewed and planned. It stops at point of treatment, but clearly we're, we're always looking at the totality of the requirement has to take account of planned and reviewed and making sure that they're not waiting on Julie. Um, so when Sharon has ref referenced red flag and urgent, we have included in the urgent category those people who are waiting too long uh, beyond their clinically indicated or their planned dates, because okay. we consider you know they are as urgent as a new urgent <coughs> patient. Okay. Uh, so we're already doing that, but referral to treatment probably excludes planned and reviewed, but it doesn't mean that we're not measuring it uh, and that we won't continue to measure and make sure that we're bringing 
their weights down as to they're not currently captured in a ministerial target, but it's clearly important for the individual. Uh, I'm sorry, you had asked aftercare, a question yeah. about the aftercare. Uh, so when we contract with IS, we have a number of routes. With, when we contract with an IS provider, we have what's called direct to send. So you're only being sent directly out for your treatment. Um, and then you come back into the trust um, or, or if, if not appropriate, if you don't need any follow-up, you won't have any. Um, that direct send doesn't have any aftercare in the IS. But we also, on occasion, will send patients out for the totality of their patients, so they're not bouncing backwards and forwards. So they might get their assessment and treatment. And then the contract will be very explicit about how many review appointments that individual gets in the IS, and it will be consistent with what they would get in the HSC, so that there's, it's, just, it's the same pathway, and therefore uh, we try and minimise that ongoing tail of spend in IS, which maybe happened when we were spending money back in 15, 16, people might have been followed up for several years. That's not the practice at this point in time. Thank you. Gemma. Thank you. Um, this might seem like a stupid question, um, but in the paper um, it says that insufficient capacity to, to discharge patients at times um, has an impact on elective care admissions. Why is this? Is this due to a lack of home care packages? Or what? And then the second question is, you mentioned as well about a review of maternity and neonatal services. Um, would you have any more information on that at the minute, or is that further on down the line? So in terms of maternity and neonatal services, I can follow up with some additional information on that. I don't have any yeah, that'd be great. material on that yeah. today. Um, the point that you're making, and it's not at all a stupid question, it's one of our, our, our key issues within mm -hmm. health and social care, that when people are medically fit to be discharged, that um, there's no one within their they're not able to go to their own home or uh, there isn't access or, or capacity within the system. Um, that is recognised as a significant issue for us and actually the Chief Nursing Officer and the Chief, Chief Social Work for Northern Ireland um, is leading a group looking at uh, delayed discharges um, in order to understand that better and in order to um, really scope out the issue and look for solutions longer term. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, yeah, um, thanks very much for your presentation. Um, just to take it back to the, the Encompass um, programme that the, the department's working on, some of the points that Palma made in and around the missed appointments, um, the do not attend and could not attend, was, was there any analysis in and around the, the DNA and CNAs? Was any of that factored in when you were uh, working on the, the Encompass programme? Um, I'm just thinking back as an example, the, when the Mental Health Service framework came out, there was, no, um, there was nothing specifying around you know, um, analysing the people that, that do not or cannot attend their appointments. And I'm just thinking with the backlog on, and the pressures on the waiting lists, if the department was able to find a way of identifying how you're, you know, catching those people before they fall out of the system to come back on again at a later stage, was any of that factored in just in any of those um, um, discussions? And I'm happy to um, provide further information, but I do know that colleagues on the board who are responsible for mental health um, have been looking at because actually written reminders of an appointment and a text message for a cohort of um, individuals it, it is not the, not the best way to remind anybody or to communicate about an appointment. Um, so they are looking at the you know, appropriate telephone numbers for um, family members or friends to actually do it. So, so there is a bit of work on that because I think um, some of the traditional methods just don't work for um, cohorts of patients. Um, but I'm happy to uh, speak with colleagues um, who work in our social care directorate to get more information. Thank you. Um, will, will the new elective care plan set out um, more specific outcomes than the two, 2017 plan? Uh, specific outcomes in terms of targets and and how the how the waiting lists are going to be addressed. So the elective care plan, in overarching terms, sets out where we're going to focus our energy. <coughs> the plans that we're referring to in terms of any additional money will absolutely be clear about what we're buying or what we expect to deliver. So there'll be more like an operational plan to say, if we get £30 million, here's exactly what we will deliver or what we will get for that. 
in the same way that that has happened over previous years, Chair. So there's a there's a plan at operational level to make sure we remain on track and that we get value for money, and then the overarching elective care plan, which just sets out what areas that we need to look at moving forward. Yeah, and just a quick point on Gemma's point in relation to maternity. You will revert to the committee with those figures. Okay. Well, listen. Um, Thank, thank you for coming along. I think we, we all share the view that it's totally unacceptable where, where these waiting lists are at. Some of the reasons that are being put forward around growing and ageing populations should be being built into and being planned for by the system rather than being used as, as reasons. Why not? I think there's also a very clear desire that as well as exploring and maximising the in-house potential, we would be seeking that that be very, very quickly developed and built so that the in-house can manage more um, in the time ahead, that we have a stable, well-resourced well, uh, well health service of our own without, without going outside of the areas. And we will be uh, seeking further updates on the, on the emergency department. But for now, thank you for coming along today, and thank you, uh, thank you for the rest of the meeting. Okay, members, um, I think we'll now take a very quick comfort break there and maybe be back in for the latest ten past ready to go again. Member, program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly. Okay, members, thank you for rejoining. And we will now have a briefing from the NA Commissioner for Children and Young People. So we can advise members that the Commissioner for Children and Young People is here today to brief the committee on the findings of a report still waiting a rights based review of mental health services and supports for children and young people. May I advise members that the Nikki briefing papers in the pack have been updated. The updated papers are page three of your table papers. So we'll come in. So I'd like to welcome the, the team. So Ms. Kula Yosuma, the Commissioner, uh, Ms. Maria McCafferty, who is Chief Executive of NICI, and Mr. Robert Beatty, Policy and Research Officer of NICI. So I'd like to invite you to go ahead and brief the committee, please. Thank you very much. And, and uh, can I just say how incredibly delighted we are to be here. And this is our first evidence session since uh, the Assembly return, and we're just beside ourselves with, um, with joy. Um, so you can imagine we have a number of issues that we're working on, Nikki, that will be of interest to the committee. But today, as, as the Chair's already said, we will be concentrating on mental health and specifically our still welcome um, report, a still waiting report. I also want to say how much we welcome the cross-departmental and cross-government emphasis placed on mental health in the new decade new approach still. As many of you know, the Northern Ireland Commissioner for Children and Young People was established by legislation in 2003, and the aim of NICI is to safeguard and promote the rights and best interests of children and young people across Northern Ireland. And in doing so, we are required to take account of all provisions of the United Nations Convention on Rights of the Child. So I was appointed Commissioner uh, in March 2015, and since that time, mental health and well-being of our children has been an explicit priority of the office. This issue was not plucked out of thin air, but is based on the concerns raised by young people themselves, their families and the professionals working with them. It's estimated that up to 35% of our young people are concerned about their mental health. And we know that here in Northern Ireland, we have approximately 25% higher levels of mental ill health um, across the population than, than, the, than across the water. This, this, this uh, higher prevalence levels is often attributed to the troubles and serves a, as a reminder of the fact that the impact of the conflict is felt by, by children and young people, all of whom were born after it, it ended officially. International evidence also demonstrates that 50% of adult mental illness begins at age 14, and this rises to 75% at 18. And yet we spend less than 8% of the mental health budget on our children and young people, and this equates to less than a penny of every health pound spent we spend on children's mental health and wellbeing. 
As the Chair has said, we undertook a substantial piece of work in September 18, and we published it when we published Still Waiting. Still Waiting was structured around three areas. The direct experiences of children and young people who had used or attempted to use statutory services. So we weren't about asking young people what they thought about mental health. We were specifically asking young people what they thought about services that were designed to meet their needs. We undertook a mapping and analysis of data that was available and a mapping and an analysis of budgeting information. We also shone a light on the experiences of young people with learning disability and those who have drug and alcohol issues. We chose the title Still Waiting to reflect our overall finding that children and young people are waiting too long to ask for help, they're waiting too long to get the right sort of support even when they ask it, for it, and they're waiting too long for the, our systems to change to effectively meet their needs. In total, I made 50 recommendations that encompass the entirety of a young person's journey, from accessing to attempting to access services and support, right, right through to being discharged. The recommendations are intended to be practical and cover a range of areas, including effective collaboration, workforce, flexible treatment, awareness raising and data collection. This, what we have is still waiting, is a detailed plan. Um, that doesn't always work for the sound bites, but it's a detailed plan of how we can improve services for children and young people. In recognition of the fact that children's mental health and wellbeing cannot be addressed in silos, our first recommendation was, was to call for a multi-sectoral project board to take the recommendations forward. And therefore, we were pleased when the Department of Health actually um, agreed and chair, and chair an interdepartmental group with all the relevant authorities. Over half the recommendation and sub-recommendations have been accepted and the remainder either in principle or under consideration subject to ministerial approval or funding. A draft action plan was published by the department in September and we received a progress report um, just before Christmas and an updated action plan. I said at the launch of the report that this was not for the shelf and we have committed to ensuring that it remains relevant and indeed is fully implemented. Nikki has, uh, is very clear, we are not publishing reports that are for others to implement. We will make it our business to um, make sure that they're implementing. So today, as you know, I published the first of four monitoring report containing our analysis of progress and, and uh, our response to the work they've done. The final monitoring report is due in February 2023, which will be my final month in office. Nikki recognises that additional resources are required to fully implement some of the recommendations, and I do have an expectation that the relevant departments and agencies will bid for these accordingly. However, in many cases, progress is cost-neutral and can be made by changes to existing practice. I also recognise that none of this can happen without sufficient and suitably qualified workforce to deliver the services required and echo the, the briefing you re received from the Permanent Secretary in, in that regard. Nikki welcomes the progress update report and it is clear that relevant government departments and agencies have carefully considered still, work, still waiting recommendations and a great deal of work has gone into translating them into a practical and workable action plan. We strongly support the setting up of multidisciplinary teams in five of the GP federation areas and this will be such a significant, significant um, improvement in services. And whilst I do welcome the commitment in New Decade New Approach to roll these out to 100,000 patients by March 2021, it's not quick enough and it's not comprehensive enough. We need to roll out the MDTs to the remaining 12 GP areas as soon as possible and hope that funding and additional staff, new extra staff, will be made available for, the, for, for that purpose. And now to the not so good. The draft action plan um, published by the department is vague about timelines and next steps in respect to a number of actions. It uses the phrase ongoing and ongoing consideration instead of providing concrete timelines indicating what needs to be done and by when, making it difficult for us to uh, properly assess progress. We welcome policies and programmes referred to the, uh, the update report. We do, however, remain deeply concerned at the lack of progress or information on data and funding referral pathways, including how they're going to work with the voluntary and community sector, improving the quality of care provided at accident and emergency departments, and treatment for young people um, with drug and alcohol-related problems. There is no getting away from the fact there is not enough money in the system. For government, but for government to provide a fully costed and ambitious plan, they need robust and up-to-date data. We just can't throw money in the air and hope it all lands. We need our data. 
I share the concern around the uncertainty of the Northern Ireland blood budget and plead, and plead that it is resolved as soon as possible. However, I need to be clear again. In order to expend existing and new money efficiently and with the most effect in, in, in that it meets the best interests of our children and young people, it is crucial that we have clear data not just about numbers, but data re that reflects the experiences and views of children and young people and their families, so that we can monitor how well mental health services are responding. So whether we like it or not, it is a priority that we invest in good data and evaluations. Uh, I'm getting there. I'm, I'm nearly there. Okay. <laughs> the experiences of young people, and this is really important, were core to still waiting. And our work to ensure implementation is centered on our, around our commitment to honor those experiences. They remain core to our work to implement the findings of the report. The NICA Youth Panel continues to meet to advise us and support the implementation of the review. And indeed, they're currently working in partnership with the young people from Elef Elephant in the Room, whose work I commend to the committee, to develop a campaign toolkit which will be made available to children and young people across Northern Ireland to support their engagement with government in delivering on their right to the highest, highest attainable standards of mental health. So whilst I am frustrated at the slow progress made by the IDG in the months after the publication of Still Waiting, we are encouraged that a robust structure to implement the recommendations has finally been established. The presence of an executive and the Assembly gives us optimism that progress will be accelerated over the coming year. And finally, in view of the broad civic and political support for Still Waiting, and the fact that none of the recommendations have been rejected um, added to the considerable amount of work that all relevant authorities have undertaken to begin the process of implementation. I would be flabbergasted if the still waiting recommendations were not included in the mental health action plan as outlined in part one of the new decade new um, approach deal, which is due to be published next month. There can be no excuse for delay in improving our services. So thank you for listening, and Mairead, Robert and I are, are, are here to take your questions and, and, and engage in discussion. Okay, thank you very much for that. Um, your document, Kula, refers to uh, the, co the children, Children's Services Cooperation, Cooperation Act. Act. How is that operating in practice, or, or what's your view on how that, or how, what role have you in monitoring that? So the Children's Services Cooperation Act, as you know, is one of the, uh, one of the acts that was passed um, uh, by the Assembly before um, it went to elections in 2016. It is groundbreaking legislation in that it places a statutory duty for all relevant authorities to cooperate. It would be fair to say that we are still in the early stages of that. Um, the Children and Young People strategy has been published, and we hope that it will move on. But one of the big findings that we did have in Still Waiting, and it came from Children and Young People, is that the right hand didn't know what the left hand was doing. Um, not only that the education systems and the health system didn't always talk to each other the way they should, but also the, the role of the voluntary and community sector, because often young people and their families said that's where they were getting the most effective services. But that for some reasons, and it, it may be um, the parity of esteem, it may be GDPR, whatever, the voluntary and community sector wasn't included in the care. So um, it's clear there's a lot of work. We have a whole section on collaboration in Still Waiting. Our role in monitoring it uh, will be an interesting one. So at the moment, we're keeping a, a sort of, we're, let, we're, we're keeping a one step back. We're working very closely, and Mairead sits on, on some of the groups with the Department of Education around the Children and People's Strategy. We will advise um, the Assembly and Government where we believe it's working and where we believe it's not working. We deliberately didn't ask for a role within the legislation, but believe me, this is the one of the core pieces of legislation we have in Northern Ireland. And in, a few, uh, in about six weeks' time, we're publishing an SEN, report on SEN, and, and collaboration between the two main uh, systems will also be I'm giving you a headline on one of our findings, but it's no <coughs> surprise to anyone who spends more than 10 minutes with, with young people that uh, collaboration between systems has still a long way to go, as does pooling of resources. <coughs> we're, we're not there. We're nowhere near where we need to be, and the CSCA <coughs> is going to be a great vehicle for getting there. Thank you. And I think that's something that we all need to be keeping an eye on, to be quite honest. Um, yes, I could just it? add to what Kula's already said, Chair, as well. Um, one of the most encouraging things about still waiting and the Department of Health's role is that they have actually set up an interdepartmental group so that the various departments, including the voluntary and community sector through DFC, are cooperating to actually deliver on the recommendations 
Um, so that's encouraging in itself, and it does take cognizance of the CSCA as well. So we are encouraged by that. Yeah, and and uh, it, you've mentioned also the potential or the impact, the, the real impact of Brexit mm. on children. Can you give us some more details around that, what those may be? Do you want to answer the Brexit mm -hmm. question? Brexit, uh, well, I, I suppose, um, I mean, obviously, Nikki produced a report um, from Children and Young People's Concerns a couple of years back, actually, at the start of the whole process. Um, you know, and as we all know, a lot of these things are currently unknown in terms of that. Um, we have been meeting regularly with, you know, the Home Office and various other stakeholders to get updates. We do have round tables with every government department as well to hear from them in terms of the issues and how they're being managed and prepared for. Uh, we do have concerns that there will be adverse impacts, and in relation to young people who maybe live close to the border counties on either side of the border. There could be issues around travel to access not just health services, but obviously services in education, further education, and just in terms of family life, if partners are separated or have been divorced and so on. We're also mindful as well that there may eventually be um, concerns around travel in relation to access and paediatric cardiology services in Dublin, for example. Um, Alton Galvin Cancer Services across the border as well. But we have been assured that SLAs are in place and that at this time um, people don't have serious concerns. But as we know, this is an unfolding context um, and obviously this transition period that takes us up to the end of December this year um, is all to play for. And I know that there are concerns across the board in a range of issues. Just, and just to add to that, uh, one of our recommendations in Stillway is about extra contractual referrals, yes. i.e. where children go out of jurisdiction for a service. It, it feels, um, it, it feels it's yeah. isolating indeed. I was having a conversation with the Cancer Fund for Children today around yeah. children going for healthcare services across the water. Whereas if we, if we can utilise opportunities for all island services, yeah. it's just so much easier yeah. for families to maintain those relationships and it's so much e uh, quicker for children to access those services. And there's no reason why we can't do that for children's mental health as well as, as, as other healthcare services. Okay. okay. Thank you. So I'm going to open up to members there. At this point, I have Jerry in this order. Jerry, Pam, Orlea, Gemma, and Paula. Thanks, Chair. Um, thanks, Hi, Chair. And good to you, uh, you team, Ray and, and Robert. A um, couple of quick questions. Um, I think, if I read your report correctly, there was concerns about the Mental uh, Capacity Act. Um, if you could maybe <laughs> elaborate on that, that. <laughs> <laughs> for, for my and hopefully committee's benefit. Um, uh, just on the mental health and the waiting lists, I, I think it's, it's important, and the still waiting stuff is, is very, very useful and important, and I commend you uh, for the work you've done uh, in relation to that. Um, I think it was two weeks ago, I think, today, there was a list of organisations and sort of celebrities or famous people from here uh, that call for the doubling of mental health funding, and uh, saying that that would be... Um, uh, important and a, go a long way to attack on the waiting list. So just to comment on that, um, and I think they call for the declaration of a public um, emergency in mental health, and I think I would certainly welcome that and uh, comment on that uh, as well. And I, I think that's very important because, uh, and your, your comment in the paper about you know people are waiting too long um, to sometimes they ask for help, but also waiting too long to get the help because I think there's an attitude that basically says that all our services are wonderful and. They are very important and do great work, but they're under massive yeah. pressure, under massive yeah. strain uh, in terms of people coming to them and also staff um, who are under pressure themselves. So I think that's sometimes missed uh, from certain elements of the department, maybe, or the trust who uh, talk about mental health to say there's these services and if just people went to them. In many cases, people do go to the services, but they they're turned away or they're told to wait or to come back, and that's problematic. And obviously, people with mental health problems that leads to their mental health getting worse. Um, so yeah, just just to comment on that, um, and also I know you've done a lot of stuff around um, young people and sort of paramilitarism. Um, so maybe this is another, right, okay. is another presentation. So just quickly on that, that. Um, how does that I'll, obviously impact mental health as well? I'll, I'll, so I'll do the waiting lists and funding. Maraid will do capacity um, because. Mm -hmm. Uh, so difficult, Thank and the parametric that. stuff. So the waiting, you're quite right. The waiting, there, there are services out there, um, and the waiting lists um, are quite astonishing. So if you bear in mind that in set, we published this report in September 18, when there were 201 children, young people waiting longer than the nine-week target. A year later, that had gone to 629. 
So we were anxious about the wait in, 29, in 2018, and a year later, it had trebled. Um, as had uh, children uh, waiting. There's over 300 children and young people waiting longer than the 13 weeks for psychological therapies. So it's absolutely right to say the system is under extreme pressure. Will throwing money at it immediately work? I'm not so sure in view of the, workload, uh, in view of the workforce issues that we have. Um, there are estimates that even to get us parity with what they spend in England, um, we need another about four, four point something million. Uh, bearing in mind, I England are complaining that they don't spend enough on their children and we have 25% higher levels of mental ill health. So we need a short-term and a long-term solution. Um, the short-term, in, in our view, will be, we're not sure putting four, four and a half million into the statutory calm system in view of the workforce issues is going to work. So we may want to have a think about solutions with the com community and voluntary sector, with the third sector, with community-based services. And I'm not saying statutory doesn't need more money, it absolutely does, but we're not sure the workforce is there to meet the need. In the longer term, we definitely need at least four, I would suggest, a lot longer, it, bearing in mind what we've said about onset of mental ill health and that children represent 23% of the population in Northern Ireland. I'd quite like to see it uh, in the high teens, if not early 20 percentage points of money spent. But I'm Children's Commission, that's what you would expect me to say. So in the long term, once we get our data sorted, we can work out what services best meet the needs of children and young people in Northern Ireland and invest accordingly. We need a transformation project. We need a transformation programme. But we have a crisis now, and you can't talk about it other than a crisis. 40% mm -hmm. increase in the last five years of children attending um, ED departments um, with self-harming. 40%. Over 1,000 children in Northern Ireland attend accident emergence having self-harmed. Um, that's, that's just not tenable. So we need a, a quick solution, which will require money, but we actually need a good data and good information so that we can invest properly and prevent it end to end. Mm. Mairead will talk briefly about mental capacity because it's a really detailed piece of work and then the power and military work we've been doing. Yes. Um, Obviously, we do have concerns around the Mental Capacity Act. Um, you're absolutely right, Jerry, and it is very much around the interplay between the deprivation of liberty and the role of parents as well. And we know there's an issue that we've already raised previously with the Department of Health around 16 and 17-year-olds um, around the independent advocacy service and making sure that a young person has that service, that independent advocate service, in terms of safeguarding. Um, when we're looking at placing young people in secure accommodation and depriving them of their liberty. So we are actually seeking clarification on that at the minute. We know that the recent Supreme Court judgment around Child D, which actually looks at that interplay between deprivation of liberty for young people and the role of parents as well, has actually been explored there, and we are seeking clarity around that because we do have concerns um, based on that as well as the issue we've raised previously in the past. Um, and we can't come back to you on that when we get that. Um, in relation to young people involved with um, paramilitary style gangs and so on, I mean, you'll be aware that we've done a piece of work over the last couple of years around young people subject to paramilitary style assaults and also paramilitary recruitment, which is still ongoing across Northern Ireland, and we have raised concerns with the various stakeholders around this. In terms of mental health, obviously this has an impact on children and young people's mental health. Commissioners already raised the issue around young people who were the focus of this report around those who are um, either using, abusing substances, drugs and alcohol. Um, and very often we're hearing stories from young people across Northern Ireland that they're being recruited into paramilitary gangs to actually maintain um, drugs habits or to be drug running. Um, so there's a lot of issues around that which we've already been addressing as well. Um, in terms of the, the broader picture, we are aware that some of these young people would have mental health difficulties and mental health, and sometimes young people self-medicate, take drugs, abuse alcohol, because they are self-medicating to deal with some of the issues in their lives that they're not having addressed by the adults responsible in our society, so it is an issue for us. We also had a focus in this report as well on young people who have learning disabilities not being able to access services adequately too. So again, this is the focus of the work going forward. Thanks. Thank you. Pam. Yeah, thank you, and thank you for being here today. I was just really struck, um, Kula, when you, you 
you, you talked about the start of mental health problems in adults uh, from 14 years of mm. age. It's just, you know, it's quite frightening. And then I think back even to this week's events and, um, mm. in the Assembly and, and the autism debate mm. was well supported in that. And then I'm thinking then in terms of the weight that children are, are even having because children um, who are having to wait for an education which actually may not ever be realised because they're, they're not going to get it or they're going to be so far behind, it's absolutely going to impact on their mental health. Uh, I'm just wondering, is there anything um, there within your report in terms of um, disabilities and special, edu special educational yeah. needs um, that would be helpful going forward on this subject? Yeah. So, as, as Mairead said, we, we looked at the general population when we did the initial piece of work. Over 600 young people uh, completed the survey. But we knew that there were two groups who were particularly marginalised and weren't going to be survey-friendly anyway. And that was young people who used drugs and alcohol, as Mairead said, and those with learning disabilities. Mm -hmm. And um, we, we found, um, and Mairead's already talked about the first group, but the second group, those with learning disabilities, we found uh, in, in, inconsistent practice, it's fair to say. And in some, tr and only one trust having what, what we call an ID Calm service, which is the Southern Trust. And if you look at the Southern Trust statistics, they're quite remarkable when it comes to waiting times or no waiting times if you're in the Southern Trust. So we really do have a postcode lottery. But we, we, what we found was, like I said, inconsistent practice. What we found is the lack of talking about collaboration. We couldn't. We were concerned about collaboration within trust between CALMS and learning disability services, except in the Southern Trust. You, you went to one or the other depending on your assessed IQ. That wasn't necessarily um, based on any evidence um, that, that, we, that we, could, we felt they could stand over. And it was this notion, and I explain, I talk about it in, in this way, is that this idea that if you have a learning disability, you can't have a mental health problem. We, if only that was so, if only we could protect these children. But that's not true. You go to any special school, and like you said, um, children's mental health often deteriorates because of environmental factors, and that could be other things going on. Um, so um, we, we, the reason we focused on learning disability was so that we could ensure we, we kept on at the trusts to, to improve those services. As I've said, in end of March, we're going to publish... You think this is hard? You wait to see what we're going to say about SEN. We're going to publish our SEN review around children in mainstream schools. Okay. So we're going to, we've done a similar piece of work around SEN in mainstream um, in, in the hope that we can again provide a road, uh, the roadmap to improvement. Mm -hmm. um, but it's, and we're seeing children in special schools and we're hearing from teachers and principals in special schools saying that the mental health issues of their children coming in through the door, they can see an increase. And, the adverse childhood experience and all that affect children with learning disabilities, yet we don't have services or professionals skilled at doing that work, enough of them at doing that work with those children and families. So yes, we, have, we did look at them specifically um, and we work very closely with MANCAP on that one. Mm -hmm. um, we will be um, uh, looking at it, including Ivy, the, the, uh, the, the hospital. Um, so yeah, it's definitely on our radar. It's progress is too slow though far too slow, um, but it will, it, it is, it's, it's not going away and we'll not be, we'll not be letting it go. Okay, now, that'll be interesting, especially that next piece of work you're going to do on SAM, because yeah. uh, given back to autism, given that 78% 70, 70 of children with autism are in mainstream yeah, education. Yeah, absolutely. It's, and, and, it's, it's, and, and children with autism will, will, be, it, it, it will be reflected in that report, yeah, I can assure you. And you'll you. be aware as well that obviously the Department of Education along with colleagues in health are developing the emotional health and wellbeing mm -hmm. framework as well for schools which will go some way towards that. The post-primary counselling service is accessible by all post-primary schools including special schools. Um, one of the things that we've been calling for as well is that we should have this provision in primary schools particularly if the early intervention approach is to be um, supported and you know driven and rolled out so it's very important that we start looking at the early intervention side of this as well okay thank you okay thanks very much um so i suppose you need to as you say look at this in two ways because you've the 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 current um waiting list at the minute for for the, the young people and the children need help now um and then um you also have then the the prevention end of things mm. 
and the early intervention and how you prevent a child getting mm -hmm. to the point where they are in need of mental health services at such a young age. Um, and you know, what Jerry mentioned the point about the, the calls for a public health emergency. Um, we were at a panel discussion last week around this as well with the NI Youth Forum, who have done brilliant work yes. with Elephant mm -hmm. in the Room and all the rest. Mm -hmm. And fair play to yourselves, Elephant in the Room, because while the institutions were down, there was a bright light that was shone. Oh no, we were on working on the, it. Yeah. The issues impacting on 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 children's mental health. Um, so the. Um, but yeah, the, when we talk about um, the, the, there is a crisis in our mental health services mm -hmm. and there is a crisis amongst our young people accessing those services and the causes of their mental health problems. Um, and it's not something that's hit last week, last year. It has been, I actually remember the time of the launch of the Still Waiting Report, mm -hmm. speaking afterwards, and someone had mentioned about this sort of oncoming tsunami yeah. that had been gradually <laughs> building, and not just here in Ireland, mm -hmm. but elsewhere. Mm -hmm. But here needs to be our focus. Mm -hmm. So the, what I wanted to ask you was, I'm just conscious that you know, we've had the, you know, um, the, the Protect Life 2, which has a, an implementation group set up. We have the implementation group for the Still Waiting yes. Report. We have the um, Department of Education following on from the, the National Children's Bureau audit that now mm. have the emotional and resilience framework that's coming through um, the DE. Um, and we also have then the executive subgroup on uh, mental health that's been formulated. Mm. Also then the Department of Health five-year yes. plan, right? So for the recommendations and to get things moving. You did already mention the MDTs, uh, but it's how, how practically can, you know, we have all these implementation groups, but how can we, you know, get all this to come together to really start getting delivery for what our young people need? Protect Life 2 will hopefully go in some way to helping and assisting if we can get the funding for that strategy. As you know, education forms a big part of that. The, the, the uh, game with the, the Department of Education uh, building resilience into their curriculum. Um, the, uh, the Ulster University, they've done research, which we supported last year as well, doing that audit with the post-primary schools because yeah. things are very piecemeal yeah. in primary and post-primary, yeah. which is affecting um, all our young people. So it's maybe just a question. I'm pl really pleased to see you here today and, and for this committee to give you our support, and for me as an MLA to give you my support. Um, but it's also then, have you panned out any engagement with the other committees? Because this cuts across oh, different yeah. departments. Yeah. And have you made any contact with the executive subgroup that's been set up in and around mental health? How can you get this on that agenda? Mm -hmm. Because again, if that's on the agenda, it's helping bringing down, down rates of suicide, it's helping with the rates of self-harm. Um, and so it, it's, it's how do we start to, to bring this together? And the important thing that you also say is Kula in and around the data, I mean, this is something that is a major issue because major. how can you plan for the future for transforming mental health services whenever you have no collation yes, of the data and of the, the, the demand analysis? Absolutely. And that was something that we fit into the mental <clears throat> health service framework. It needs to be done because yeah. then you can't plan forward yeah. for that. But the presentation that we just had from departmental um, officials there, I had raised the issue even in and around the do not attends, could not attends. Yeah. Because again, the transition mm -hmm. with kids going through yeah. that, the, the services from a child to yeah. adolescents to adult mental health services. Now, what they did say is that the Health and Social Care Board um, are actually carrying out a piece of work around that. So we'll de we'll try and get more information on it. But hopefully, then you know, the more that you can you can raise these issues in consultations, you know, in strategies. As long as you're having your voice heard, you're making these points. And then the next step is practically how can you get results? Right. So um, I think we are probably. Um, I think, uh, you're right, we've got quite a lot of action plans and we've got quite a lot of strategies. And the idea is how we're going to put them all together. So, um, and, I, and I said, um, as you said at the end, the, the mental health, the, I'm so pleased to see that cross departmental group and the ministerial group. I'm so pleased to see that there's going to be an action plan. Um, I expect, still waiting, to be part of that. I don't, mm. I don't think they need me or Mairead or Robert to go and tell them it needs to be part of that. Because as you said, in the last three years, and indeed in the last five years as Children's Commissioner, we have been working on this. And we've not been working on this alone. We have been working on this with government. We have been working on this with the Health and Social Care Board. We have been working on this with voluntary community sector. And, they have been and, and different people have been working on it. And here we have an evidence-based, well-researched set of recommendations mm. that have generally been accepted. So I, don't, I do not think anyone needs to be told to include this in either that agenda or the action plan. It should be in, as, as, as should be. 
uh, should be the Protect Life. The idea of collaboration, the idea of this programme for government, the one programme for government across government, the idea of outcomes approach that, is that we do what works. Yeah. But we need to find out what that is. So that's the issue around the data piece. Mm -hmm. So um, I don't think anyone will need to be asked to do this. I think it will happen because they've been working on it. It would be a waste of 18 months or 16 months since we published of work yeah. if it's not included going forward. Um, and I don't think we want to waste any more time. Mm -hmm. We need to get on with it. We do need, though, whilst we're getting the data, whilst we're better understanding what works for our children and young people, we do need to do an investment in order to support those kids who are um, traumatised and troubled now, who need that support. We need to send the message to our young people that you can talk to somebody and somebody will be able to help. Mm -hmm. The MDTs will be phenomenal if we can roll them out because they're in, they're in the community in GP surgeries and they can do brief interventions, they can assess and work out whether the child needs to go to CALMS or back into the community. If there's good community-based services, you'll be, we'll be amazed how that waiting list will go down in the short term whilst we transform the system. Mm -hmm. So, you're at, you, you, I mean, everything you said, I, I agree with, but we all need to be singing from the same hymn sheet. The plan's there. I'm assuming what's going on at the moment in the department and in, the, in that group is that we're putting all these recommendations and strategies and action plans together for one coherent action plan. That's all we need. Mm -hmm. We don't need to do any more work. There'll be a, a brief consultation period, no doubt, but we don't need to do any more finding or work uh, or f making recommendations. We've got enough and we've got enough to be getting on with, I suppose. So we're all in agreement, all of us. Thank you. Gemma? Thank you. Thank you very much for coming along today. Um, and I share your, your frustration over the MDTs as well. Um, I'm from Fermanagh and we're, I suppose, like across the north, we're um, experiencing a GP crisis. So I mm. think that the sooner we get them, the better. Yeah. Um, just a question as well. You've said uh, that the lack of 24-7 cover in three of the trusts is unacceptable. What, which three trusts is that under the Robert, acute Robert, care plan? Do you remember what three trusts? I think I want to say... Northern and Southern, I want to say, but I might be wrong, but Robert, Robert will, will get that. There's, there's different levels of service, but I'm fairly sure it's Northern and Southern. I'll, I'll look it up. We'll get Brandy back to you once. <laughs> Sorry. And the no, other you're right, one. it's a good question. It's absolutely a good question. The other question is about the youth panel subgroup on mental health. What's the makeup of that in terms of geographical spread? Do you know that off the top of your head? Our youth panel is from across Northern Ireland. Yeah. Uh, uh, can I promise you there's somebody from Fermanagh? I can't, <laughs> but I'm fairly on the youth panel because I can't see their wee faces. But um, we have, we did a recruitment last year Met where we went um, across and we recruited specifically from within those communities. And do they meet in Belfast or do they meet in Usually they will meet in Belfast, Gemma. Um, we do try to get outside Belfast as much as possible. When we do big events, we go outside Belfast. But the subgroups, which are obviously a lot smaller, you know, the youth panel currently comprises over 70 young people from across Northern Ireland. Um, when we have the subgroups, they meet in Belfast because it's easier, and we'll obviously make sure that the young people are supported to reach Belfast as well. Um, we have striven repeatedly we to tried. make sure that the we diversity tried, of the makeup of the youth mm -hmm. panel geographically, demographically, in all kinds of ways in terms of identity and you know backgrounds yeah. um, is as representative as possible. And then when young people want to join, then we will go through those processes. Um, it is um, one of those things that you know you can't have every young person. No, in course. an ideal world, you would have the voice of every single young person. Yeah. But the subgroup meets in Belfast with our staff. We did try to go rural, but actually it was impossible. Yeah. I, I, this is something you need to take up with TransLink. All yeah. buses mm -hmm. lead to Belfast. I know. I know. So it is almost impossible to ask a child from Mama to even to get to Derry, let alone uh, for Manor. Yeah. So. The way, the way our public transport system, it all comes into yeah. Belfast, um, or Bangor, actually. Um, so uh, we, we, it, the young people in the end said, yeah, thank you for trying to go local, mm -hmm. but it's actually much easier Anyone. if we just come to Belfast. Yeah. So we did try. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not your fault. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Gemma. Uh, Paula? Um, thank you. Um, I think my, mine's quite a similar question in the sense that um, the way this is photocopied, well, I can't actually well, see you your commentary, see but mm -hmm. it's really just to pick up on the psychiatric mm -hmm. intensive care provision and the um, business case for four beds at Beechcroft, and I'm assuming that's Beechcroft in my like, Belfast constituency, yes, which it is. is great. However, I'm very conscious that if, if you know, a minor is, is admitted 
I would imagine they would add extra stress if they were from Derry or Enniskillen and they were having to come up. And so I just wanted a bit of commentary then around, um, you know, obviously, I'm maybe put words in my mouth, four beds, you know, is that anywhere going to cut in terms of meeting the, the, the need um, and what you're doing around that? And then this, the second one is more, it's not, it's, it might come across as a, a negative comment, but I'm concerned that when we are talking about a mental health crisis, we're letting people get a message that there's no hope. No. There's no services. No, you're right. Mm -hmm. And that we, we know that people, you know, when they're at their very darkest point, it's whenever there is no hope that that's whenever they will mm -hmm. attempt and, and unfortunately sometimes, um, you know, commit suicide. And so I'm just wondering how we get the balance right in that because the last thing we want is people sitting at home, you know, fretting. But I do think there aren't enough provisions. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's really about the public conversation. It was southern. It is southern and west, okay. uh, northern western. <laughs> um, so you're quite right about the no hope message. Yeah. The, the issue f is how you manage the, the balance between removing the stigma by talking about yes. it and saying that to people who need to sort it out, this is a, this is a dire situation, yeah. and it is a dire situation. The issue is. Would children, young people, and communities <coughs> expect us to sit here and go, it's all right? They know. Mm -hmm. Do you know that yeah. they know there's yeah. a crisis? Yeah. So we do, but you're absolutely right. We do need to say. So we did a webinar. I did a webinar with uh, over um, 70 schools, 50 primary and 20 post primary on this very issue on, on, on Tuesday. Okay. And that was exactly the conversation we had okay. with those children. Mm -hmm. Please talk to somebody. Yeah. There will be somebody who, and there is a trusted adult who wants to help you and who will work with you and fight you. And if not, come to us and we're, if you're not getting the services you need. So there are services there. Yeah. There are people in the communities, there are people in your schools, your families. They want you to talk about this and they want you to get the services. So it is absolutely right to say, um, which is why we're working on the toolkit with young people. This idea that we're not doing anything on mental health mm -hmm. is not right. Mm -hmm. We are actually spending £31 million a year between education and health on our children's wellbeing and mental health. Is that enough? No, it's not. Do we know how much, how much outcomes we're getting for that? <laughs> no, we're not. But we do know there are services, mm -hmm. and we do know there are helplines. Childline was with us that day. So it's, it's really important that nobody listening to this or watching this goes away thinking there is no services for our children. There are. There just needs to be more. And, but the reason we, the, and one of the reasons we've got an increase is we're removing the stigma, which yeah. is fabulous. It's fantastic. But you're absolutely right, Paul. We, we need to balance it. I'm going to ask colleagues to see if anyone wants to ask about uh, hospital care. beds before we... No, we're, we're aware in terms of Beechcroft because we have periodic meetings, Paula, with the Health and Social Care Board, and we know that they increased the coverage in terms of staffing for beds, so the, the number of beds that were able to be used <laughs> has gone up. Um, you know, it's one of those things that we have to keep monitoring as part of our role. Mm -hmm. Currently, we are unaware we have raised in the past, though I have to say, the issue of children going on to adult wards, because it has been a concern for Nikki. Now, we know that had gone down and reduced. Um, we assume then that the number of beds being increased in Beechcroft was as a result of the concerns being raised. Um, and we know that there's workforce issues in the department, and we know that there's issues in terms of workforce generally. And I know that you know there's been an issue with staff having to be um, brought in from England to cover um, these beds and so on. Um, but that is something that we monitor with the Health and Social Care Board on a regular basis as well. The geography as well. The geography. So we. So the issue, and Mary said, there's a workforce. There's a workforce yeah. issue. So I would. We would rather have a centre of excellence or yes. a centre, good practice than dissipate. I had the privilege of going into Beechcroft uh, before Christmas um, and meeting with the young people, including from the, the southwest and the northwest, as well as from Belfast and actually um, Hollywood, um, and all, all four corners uh, of Northern Ireland. And um, the young people were clear that whilst they did want to be home, mm -hmm. um, and they didn't necessarily want to be, they understood why they were there, mm -hmm. and they understood that actually in some cases it was keeping them yeah. safe okay. and alive. Mm -hmm. So you, my preference has always been, our preference has always been that our major towns have facilities. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, mm -hmm. I'm not, we're not confident we can manage that. Okay. And we'd rather the children travel the wee way and that the, the, the system facilitated parents come in. It's the same with IV, children mm -hmm. with learning disability and mental health, seven beds in IV in the middle of Belfast. But again, 
Um, that's at least we can guarantee quality of care that way. Um, and, and the idea with the 24-7 services um, is that we need, we need residential less mm -hmm. and extra contractual less because uh, we can look after our children in the, in the community. So I would share your concerns, but at the moment it's, it's the best way we can guarantee a quality service for those kids. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. Yeah, thank you. And Jeanette. Thank you, Chair. Um, and to be fair, it was that geographical concern that jumped out at me. I suppose looking at it, and I commend you on this, because I think there's a lot in here that is practical, yes. and, and you're talking about cost neutral, yes. mm. and it really is within reach, yes. um, and easy reach, and I, I see no obstacle to anybody committed to this field that they wouldn't attempt to, to make those early gains for everybody's sake. Um, but I would ask then, I, against each of you talked about you mapped out resources and you mapped out budget. And we tried. Yes, as best you could, in the absence of data, you know, and I accept that. Um, in terms of then going forward, against each of the recommendations, and like I say, you know, I recognise a lot of this is cost neutral and, and common sense, you know, in a lot of places. But have you put against the recommendations, for example, I know you say in resource implications, have you an overall cost of delivering on this? No, we didn't, um, because the, the, the data was insufficient, uh, we, and we couldn't do that. We have asked them to do that, um, okay. because they know what bits of the system yeah. they can you know, tweak, what bits yeah. of money they can take from there to reinvest there. So they have agreed that they should, so we've asked them to produce, to, to cost each initiative where they say, funding and they have agreed to fund that properly okay. subject again subject to funding we haven't costed because the information wasn't there mm -hmm. and we want if we're going to into a genuine transformation process yeah. there is a there is a good possibility that we'll be able to reinvest some of the money we spend uh, whilst making the decision about what new money we have but that's been the question we have asked them okay. is to to give us a costed plan and, and what they're doing about bidding for additional monies in order to make that happen. Okay. So so we, yeah, we haven't done that. I accept no. that because, because what I was going to ask in, in transformation generally across services, for example, there are calls for a drugs task force. So should there be within that a stream that looks exclusively at, at young people. younger people? Always. You know, and, and, and that type of thing. So Absolutely. it isn't specific to your recommendation, mm -hmm. but it's an answer. Mm. To, to the problem, mm. ultimately, which is a shared space, and it's a better use of maybe Absolutely. shared resource. Mm -hmm. um, but but I did have the concern in terms of um, that that geographical reach out because if this is a vulnerable young child in any part of Northern Ireland, um, I would like to think that our final landing place would be that a each home. child has easy access mm -hmm. to that call out for I need help. Yes. That should be universal, Absolutely. and also that the service where appropriate comes to them first, as opposed to the child being removed from their environment. And maybe there are times where being removed from your environment is actually the better thing that they need that skip. But ultimately, you know, if it's if the assessment is that the child needs a service brought to them, I would like to think that mm. there would be no postcode lottery in that. I suppose one of the things just to say in response to that um, as well, Sinead, is obviously we have um, a five-tier system in terms of the CAMS model. There's a step care model, um, and obviously those lower tiers are about earlier intervention um, and community services as well, because we know a lot of people access mental health services and support in local communities as well. So, you know, theoretically and hopefully we're in the direction of travel that that will be the case um, that they can actually access the service and obviously they will access services through their gps um, as well and then it's up to the gp as to where that child has to be referred and as cool has already pointed out there will be a case when the need for acute care mm -hmm. and hospitalization is appropriate but the answer really is about the earlier intervention and the earlier stage, which is why we keep going on about, you know, what can we do earlier in a child's life generally? Um, and we know that the prevalence study that's been conducted by the Ulster University in Queen's at the minute is due to be finished in May, because again, going back to your question around budget for this, it is absolutely vital that we have the data so we know where the mm -hmm. need is mm -hmm. and that we match that and map that 
to meet that need, wherever that need is as well. And that is why we've been, I suppose, banging on about that for so long as well. One other thing just to mention in relation to costings was um, we did ask the CAM service, because we know currently there's 7.8% of the mental health budget goes into CAMs, child and adolescent mental health services. Um, they had informed us during the course of the research that w I think an additional 4.5 million would have brought Open. that up and meant Open that 4.8. Sorry, thanks, Robert. Um, would have brought that up to the level it needed to be in relation to CAM services. But that's not all of the mental health support and services that you're talking about as well, nor us as well. So hopefully that gives you a wee bit more insight into it. And also, just going to make one more observation for this side of the room is about if you, the data that the mm. Health and Social Care Board are publishing. Belfast data includes South. Southeastern Health and Social Care Trust. Mm. At the moment, we can't um, pull Just out aggregate. the Southeastern data, which may be of interest. Um, and we've asked them to uh, put that because Belfast runs some of the service mm. for mm. the Southeastern. But that doesn't mean they can't collect postcodes of the children who attend, mm -hmm. in order that we understand who is in 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 the down and south down, in the north down and south down areas. Mm -hmm. Um, so that's that, uh, that's an issue we have asked them uh, yeah. uh, to address. Uh, I, forgot, I forgot about okay. Lisbon. It's in that area as well. Mm -hmm. I don't want people from Lisbon from, from, uh, <laughs> telling me I forgot them. But we, we need to understand, mm -hmm. as Marais said, geographically so that we can yeah. design our services accordingly. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. And thank you for that very comprehensive briefing and, and, and the piece of work around the, the document. Um, it has struck me, as we, as we discussed there, that a large amount of the issues that we've all discussed at previous times around social isolation, connectedness, emotional support, caring responsibilities, mm -hmm. children sometimes appear to be almost an afterthought in, in a lot of those where yeah. they actually need yeah. to be front and centre. I think you're doing good work in that. That actually even, and it's, it's funny how, uh, how many times data has come up here, and I think, would members agree that we maybe ask the department for a yes. briefing specifically around these yeah. data issues mm -hmm. yeah. in terms of how, that, how that's being linked into transformation and how Absolutely. they're proposing to, to plan, mm -hmm. because Absolutely. if we don't have the data, we can plan. So we're, we're agreed on that. Yeah. Listen, I'd like to thank you all very much for the briefing and to wish you well in, in your you. important work. I think we're all, we're all hoping and working for a future where no child is still waiting for the help that they need and deserve. So thank, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you again soon. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. okay, members, thank you for that. And we are now moving on to the uh, subordinate legislation items. And I refer members to the clerk's memo at page 50 of the table pack. So, members will recall that we considered a number of statutory regulations and agreed not to object to them, subject to the examiner of statutory rules report. Can I advise members that the report has now been published and is available on the Assembly website? The clerk's memo and related papers confirm the list of statutory rules in respect of which the ESR raised no issues and to which we did not need to return. It also flags a number of SRs which breached the 21-day rule, but states that the Department provided adequate explanations for those breaches. Are members content to note those? Okay. I will refer to the ESR's view as we deal with each SR before us today. So, Can I refer members to the Clerk's memo on pages 124 to 126 of the pack, which deals with the five statutory rules for consideration at today's meeting? So the first one is mental capacity research regulations, and I refer members to packs 127 to 132, pages 127 to 132. Members considered this ASR on the 23rd of January and agreed not to object to it, subject to the report of the examiner of statutory rules. The statutory rule deals with the designation of bodies which may authorise research involving persons lacking capacity. The examiner of statutory rules raised an issue with the regulations and the department agreed that the SR exceeded the power granted under the Mental Capacity Act in that, rather than listing authorised bodies as intended, the SR states that bodies may be authorised by the department at some future point. The department has therefore laid substitute regulations which we will deal with in a moment. The examiner has indicated that she is content that such a substitu substitution would address the issue raised. Are members content, therefore, with their original decision that it is not necessary to object to SR 2019-193 on the basis that it has now been replaced by SR 
2020 forward slash 17, which the committee will be scrutinising separately now. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you. So moving on to SR 2020 forward slash 17, the mental capacity research amendment regulations NA 2020. And I refer members to pages 133 to 145 of the pack. As we have discussed, this SR has been led to substitute the previous regulations and provide a list of those who can act as appropriate bodies for the purpose of approving research under the Mental Capacity Act 2016. Given the urgency of addressing the issue, the SR is already in force and has not met the usual requirements to be led for a period of 21 days before taking effect. While the ESR has indicated that a substitute regulation specifying the relevant bodies would address her concern, her formal view on this ESR will be included in her next report, so any decision today will still be subject to that report. Have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with the statutory rule? Chair, just quickly, um, I was unaware of the court case around Child D, and I'm not familiar with it. Can I request we get some more information on that? I'm guessing it's still ongoing, but the best of uh, the, the most updated information on that I think would be useful. I think. Members content that we seek that information? Yes, is that a case here? Sure. I'm sorry. assuming it is, and I'm unaware, I just coolly mentioned it. Um, so it's something I'm unfamiliar with at all, yeah. to be honest with you. Yeah. Yes, um, just on the the, the um, statutory, the new statutory rule 2020 20, 17, um, the list of um, the ethics committees um, were obviously the the um, examiner has, has done a list that, that we need to be abided by in the rule, um, but there's no. There's no representation um, from any of the universities in the south of Ireland um, from any of their ethics committees, and I was just wondering why they weren't included in that list. I'm not sure if they haven't been, um, you know, consulted or involved in this process previously um, when carrying out research. So it was just a question as to why that they weren't included, because um, there would obviously be concerns as well post Brexit. Um, you know, if you were limiting any research that was to be carried out um, under these rules, if you were to limit any of that post Brexit? Well, I think we can request info and uh, mm. request updated information that and defer, defer the. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, can I ask members that we formally defer? Yep. That the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 17. The Mental Capacity Research Amendment Regulations, NA 2020, and subject to the examiner of rules. We're, we're, we're agreeing to defer that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, we're great. Okay, moving on to health and personal, super, personal social services, superannuation, health and social care pension scheme amendment regulations. I refer members to pages 146 to 154 of the pack. So, members, we return to the HSC pensions regulation discussed last week. No issue has been raised in relation to this SR by the examiner of statutory rules. Members will recall the department indicated it will be willing to ask the scheme advisory board, comprised of employers and the unions, to look into the issues we raised in relation to the impact of current policies on part-time workers and any potential for indirect discrimination. Are members content in the first instance that we write to the department to confirm that we would like to take up this offer? Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Secondly, as we were briefed, to seek to annul these regulations would remove the legal underpinning for the current pension system without anything to put in its place. But I therefore suggest to members that we scrutinise pensions policy going forward rather than objecting to this rule. Uh, are members any views on that? Okay. I think it's a sensible. Okay. So, uh, have members any further issues they wish to raise in connection with that? So, if not, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2019 forward slash 62, Health and Personal Social Services Superannuation and Health and Social Care Pension Scheme Amendment Regulations and has no objection to the rule? Are we agreed? Moving on to the Healthy Start Scheme and Day Care Food Scheme Amendment Regulations, NI 2017. I refer members to pages 155 to 163 of the pack and correspondence from the department tabled in hard copy. So, 
So, members, we return to the Health Start Scheme and Daycare Food Scheme amendment regulations discussed last week. No issue has been raised by examiner of statutory rules in relation to this one. Members will recall that the SR adds universal credit recipients to the list of those entitled to Healthy Start vouchers. Members had asked for further information on how access to the scheme via universal credit would compare with access under legacy benefits and also inquired about the timing of entitlements. In hard copy is a response referring to the earnings threshold of £408 per week. It states that the Department's estimate was that the change from legacy benefits to universal credit would result in around 2,000 additional claimants, but that a similar number of claimants would lose out and that a group of families. Sorry, uh, Chair. Where is that response? Sorry, Chair. In hard copy on the back of the table. Uh, Would you know the back of the table page. papers today. Oh, okay, thanks. Okay. So that uh, some families likely to be in part time work on very low earnings would gain from Healthy Start for the first time. Thank you. Very okay. Thanks. In terms of timing, I understand that once a claimant is notified of success in applying for universal credit, they can then apply to this scheme and that an automated process will confirm entitlement. Uh, members, as with the pre previous item, given the pressure to come to a view today, we may not wish to object to this rule and block access to the scheme for those who are in receipt of universal credit, but we can, of course, review this matter at any time and make further recommendations. Do members have any views in relation to that? Just briefly, Chair, I raised an issue last week about the delay of universal credit, and appreciate the clerks uh, work on that. But maybe in the future we could look at sort of people who are maybe waiting a long time to get the access to their benefits. <coughs> because my guess is there will be potentially a hold up on people getting under the scheme. So if we could look at that in a few weeks' time, I think that would be useful. I think it's something that we could take a look at in forward planning at, at some point. Um, in relation to uh, in relation to any further issues they wish to raise in connection with that statutory rule. Sorry, Chair. I suppose um, we're we're in a position where we can we're big between a rock and a hard place here. You know, we don't really have time without there being difficulties in those people who are entitled continuing to receive money. So you know, it would be wrong of us to do anything that would stop that. But there are still questions there. You know. Even the thing talks about the model size, the sample size being uncertain. So there are question marks. So I do think we need to scrutinise further yeah. um, at a later time. But I certainly wouldn't be objecting to stopping anybody having access okay. entitled. Thank you. Um, so if not, then can I ask members to agree formally that a Committee for Health has considered SR 2017 forward slash 200, the Healthy Start Scheme and Daycare Food Scheme Amendment Regulations NI 2017 and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Please. And yet, could we, could we just confirm that the, the committee are content to seek further information in relation to universal credit issues? Yeah. Right. Yeah. Okay. Moving on now to SR 2019 forward slash 42, the provision of health <coughs> services not ordinarily resident amendment regulations NA 2019. So I'll refer members there to pages 164 to 179 of the pack and some additional information which has come there and is in, within table papers in, in 57 to 58 of your table papers. Everyone okay with that? Uh, so members will recall we discussed this SR on 23rd of January. It provided for continuation of healthcare entitlements for certain categories of people should the UK exit the EU without an agreement. No issue has been raised by examiner of statutory rules. Item 13.2 in table papers has been received from the department in response to our request for further information. The Department advises that the SR has been deferred as it was prepared in case the UK exited the EU without an agreement. Secondly, the Department has stated that the provisions are to be reviewed ahead of 31st December and are subject to, a further, to a future negotiations. Are members content on the basis that whereas we want to scrutinise policy around Brexit, there, do members feel that, that there are issues around this SR? Or issues that, yeah. 
Sure, just just clarity. My understanding is reading that um, is it basically it undermines the basis of the NHS um, and it paves the way for basically charging people who are seeking the right to remain um, here. Um, and just want to want some clarity on that. And if that's the case, then obviously that would create a, a hierarchy of, of people who are on well need treatment. So. And uh, that's my reading of it. Um, and if that's the case, then I would, I would have serious problems if it's you know paving the way and uh, uh, potentially charging people for, for treatment. That would be something that um, I and I'm sure others would be uh, opposed to. Yeah, yeah I, have, I have concerns about this as well. Um, basically, the same concerns that we shared the last day, um, that you know there's no guarantee of healthcare provision for frontier workers who begin work in the north after exit day. Um, there is no guarantee of healthcare provision to students who arrive, um, and we we need to attract um, workers and students to the north. And you know, if this if the attraction of healthcare is taken away, you know, it leaves us in serious bother, um, and as well, it leaves us vulnerable and exposed to aggressive measures if um, one state withdraws the right, the reciprocal rights. So I would have serious concerns with this still as well. So just to, uh, to say to members, just to, to bear in mind, obviously that, that it's no longer in with the department's advice is that this one actually isn't in force anymore. They've deferred it. So objecting to it, you know, is something the committee could do, technically speaking, but they may wish to consider that it's not actually the, the department's advice that's been deferred, and nothing will be put in its place until the end of December at the earliest, subject to what is negotiated this year. So it's something members have a bit more time to consider and reflect upon and come up with proposals to influence the department as part of your Brexit scrutiny, if that's satisfactory. With that being so, why would we agree to it at this yeah. point? Yeah. It? Mm. Um, members aren't asked to agree to it as such. They're asked, do they wish to um, uh, seek to, do they wish to object and table a motion in the assembly to object to the statutory rule? But you'd be objecting to something we've been told has been deferred already. It doesn't. It's okay, Jack, can I, can I, does it need to be tabled at this committee if it has been withdrawn or deferred? Uh, sorry, sorry, sorry Orlea. Orlea. Yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, Orlea. so that's uh, that, that's the, the confusion around this this one for me, um, because the, this statutory rule was obviously based on um, a, a no deal um, exit from the European Union, um, which isn't the case. So. I was just wondering, there's no point in us passing a statutory rule that's been designed for a no-deal Brexit when there hasn't been a no-deal Brexit. Um, and, if, and, and all the flaws aside, cause, which have been pointed out already, I, I, would, I wouldn't be content even to, to, to pass it, to have it deferred, when it's already flawed to begin with. If we were to start a new process with the department looking at the forward work planning in and around a you know Brexit scenario at the end of their um, negotiations. You would really, this wouldn't be a good starting point for me. So I would, I'm, I'm not content with it as as it is, and I wouldn't be content to, um, to support to defer it. If that makes sense. It's a <laughs> no, it was more just to come back to a point I raised before around the, the departmental officials coming in and giving us an update on on, on their planning because. But sooner rather than later, I do appreciate you know you're talking about December. But I think the sooner we actually start to interrogate what is being proposed, the better as a committee, because they may need to come back two or three times between now and December. So I would I would stress the urgency within the department. But mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, Chair, could I just ask? I, I know that we've been asked um, to make commentary, but are we in a position today to note it rather than do anything else? Because note it with expressed objections because there there are minefields here in terms of um i'm sure the economy committee would have interest in this in terms of seasonal workers for example you know there's so many holes in this that haven't been properly discussed and and don't all rest with us exclusively and um, so i would be keen to do a lot more than note it mm. this stage how do members feel would that be appropriate yeah. Okay, so do I need to put that or do we simply note it? Just note it, yeah. yeah okay. Okay, so. Um, I'm sorry, sorry, Chair. I mean, will there be notification to the department about concerns were raised or just in terms of that process? How, do, how does that work? 
Um, I no. can advise members we've already um, flagged with the department that we will be looking for Brexit. I would expect the committee to be looking for a briefing on Brexit and to start the policy scrutiny um, within the next month or so. Okay. Um, and in terms, in terms of information, if the department are going to be bringing forward um, items like this which are proposed to remain on a shelf to December mm -hmm. time, I think they need to provide a, a rationale for that, which I don't think has been the case here, mm -hmm. to be quite honest. Yeah. Okay, members, thank you. Turning now to correspondence, can I refer members to pages 183 to 226 of the pack and also to your table pack? Are members content with the proposed actions as noted in the correspondence memo at pages 183 to 184 of the pack, subject to our earlier agreement to schedule a dedicated session on emergency department waiting times? We have already discussed. Are members content? Mm -hmm. uh, this issue connects to correspondence in in at 14.17 and the correspondence and table papers. Forward work then. May I refer members to the draft forward work programme in table papers at pages 67 to 68. This version has replaced the one in the pack. Can I draw members' attention to the proposed date for the committee's strategic planning day on 19th of March to be held in the junction in Dungannon? Are members content to note the forward work programme? Yeah. Any other business then? Do members have any other business? Chair, can I just um, thank members who have up till now been involved in the loneliness work that has happened um, outside of the assembly setting and note today that NISRA have um, published a report on loneliness and just a gentle reminder to members that there is a meeting today to constitute the uh, APG on preventing loneliness at 3.30. Everybody's welcome. Thank you. Thank you. And then date and time and place of the next meeting. Uh, the next meeting will take place at 10.30 a.m. on Thursday, 13th of February, 2020, in the Senate Chamber buildings. Thanks. From the Ireland Assembly, Senate Chamber, Program signed.